On my way up here uh, from Miami this morning, I was thinking I actually haven't spoken publicly in about a year, and uh, in that time, we've done some pretty cool stuff, and when I was thinking about what I wanted to speak about, I couldn't necessarily come up with one topic, so I came up with four. Um, I'm going to bunch them together. These are four things that have been on my mind um, all year. It's things that we've been testing at the agency, and these are things that really run pretty much all my businesses, and it's also the same things that we instill within our clients' businesses as well. So uh, pardon me while I get queued up here. Okay, so the four things, number one is audience development. It's something that we as marketers, especially on the SEO side, we get a little bit too technical sometimes. We focus too much on data, too much on keyword rankings, uh, and we don't develop audiences. This is something that, again, drives a lot of my businesses and allows me to run a lot of them on auto autopilot. The next thing is UX. Um, focusing on the user experience uh, and really honing in on what it is that we should be doing to focus on our customers uh, and the power of that on today's web, especially, especially when you look at that from a design plus a marketing scope. It's very, very powerful stuff. So number three, I'm going to talk about additional opportunities for exposure. A lot of the times as marketers, we get way too focused on just marketing our website um, in the way that especially the Google al algorithm is working now, social media algorithms. Sometimes we just can't get exposure no matter how hard we try. So I'm going to talk about um, some parasite opportunities that have been working really well for us. Uh, and number four, if you guys have seen any of my stuff before, I am a process-based marketer. I don't like to do work. And when you build a process that allows you to either offshore or automate work, it's by far the most important thing that I've done for any of my businesses. It's a large reason why I'm able to come here, uh, take a week out of my time to build a deck and speak while I still have a number of businesses to run because of the processes that we've built. So, uh, just a little bit about myself, um, for those of you who are unaware of me. Again, my name is Ryan Stewart. I have over 10 years of experience working in digital marketing. I got my start working for a large consulting firm where I was doing managing the SEO and really the performance marketing for brands like Target, uh, Best Buy, um, Visit Florida, some really, really big websites. So I was very fortunate early on in my career to get some really good experience, um, specifically on the technical side of things. Um, I built, scaled, and sold a number of businesses now. I have a couple of e-commerce properties. I recently sold the agency portion of my business, Webris, in January of this past year, um, which was very exciting. Uh, I've grossed over a million dollars in sales and revenue selling uh, online trainings and tools as well, which I will be plugging throughout this, don't you worry. Um, and currently, the majority of my time, I serve as partner at the agency that acquired my agency, Webris, from the future. I'm a partner there. I focus on high-level sales um, and also running a lot of side projects for the agency as well. So you can connect with me, just get this out of the way. I'm on YouTube and Instagram. Um, those are probably the two best ways. YouTube I use more for business. Instagram is more personal if you care. Um, again, I have tools and training available on our website at webers.org. And if you're interested in hiring our agency or personal consulting, I'm available for that as well. So now that I got those plugs out of the way, uh, let's get into the details. So is that me? Okay. This past year, I've worked uh, on over 100 campaigns, both for clients uh, and our own internal brands. And uh, based on this data, I'm going to share, again, what's on my mind, my best marketing insights, uh, and just give you everything that I have in my mind. And also, by the way, too, I realize that you guys are pretty worn out, too, so I'm going to try and make this a little bit more engaging. At the end of each one of these, I'm going to open up and see if you guys have any questions. I tend to speak very fast. Already. Okay, what's up? Yeah, of course. Yeah, please don't take notes. Just <laughs> listen. We'll, it'll, it'll, it'll be online. Um, okay, so let's talk about our audiences. Um, again, this is something that it doesn't get talked about enough, especially I'm getting the vibe that a lot of people here are beginners. This is something that it doesn't get addressed. I don't want to touch that then. <laughs> um, this is something that just does not get talked about enough. Um, and it's really doing the strategy up front, and it's the difference between, really, between success and not success. Um, and it matters because, so again, we waste a lot of resources focusing on people who don't contribute to growth, um, either on paid search or Instagram or Snapchat, just literally wasting time and resources. Um, helping, de helping develop your audience up front will alleviate that. Um, we want to cater to customers. We want to cater to people who pay. This was a big awakening for me this past year was that I was spending a lot of time catering to people who weren't paying for shit. And at the end of the day, um, the people that matter are the people that pay, our customers. We want to focus on who our customer is and really blow that out and expand that audience and get more customers. So it also helps us to determine our marketing mix. Again, I work with clients all the time 
who just waste resources on things like Snapchat because they don't understand who their core customer is. They think that they need to be there because they saw some video um, or some big name marketer talking about a new hack when it's a complete waste of time. We uh, so again, it helps us determine the marketing mix. It helps us determine where we need to be present and how we can better invest our resources, and especially for if you're just getting started, where you should invest your time. Um, these things are all backwards. So just for me personally, when I was building my agency, Webris, I thought I was building an agency. Um, again, Webris, the agency that I just sold, we were a search marketing agency. We got to over a million dollars in revenue uh, within 18 months. We were recently acquired, like I said. Um, but one of the reasons why I wanted to sell the agency was because when I really sat down and looked at my data, I realized that I was wasting my time and resources and I was literally leaving a lot of money on the table because my data showed differently. When I looked at the content that people were consuming, when I looked at the people who were commenting on my YouTube videos, when I looked at the insights from my Facebook page, I realized that they were not agency potential customers. They were marketers just like yourself uh, and they were other agency owners. So I completely shifted everything. I unloaded the agency portion of it. I still own a part of it, but I got that off my plate. And now I'm focused specifically more on trainings and tools for marketing professionals. And that's really where I see the progression of my career going. And once I did that, and once I made that shift, there was a drastic change um, in my income, to be point blank. So 99% of my audience was non-transactional. So this is what I call the concentric circles. It's literally the same thing as a marketing funnel. I just like to be a little bit fancy sometimes. Um, but essentially what you're looking at here was what my concentric circles were before I made the change. So on the outside, I had people who were aware. Those are people like yourself. You know, maybe see me speak at a conference, maybe saw a YouTube video here and there. Um, you know, you're just aware of my presence and aware of what we do. And then in the yellow there, we have fans. So got a bunch of good YouTube subscribers, Facebook followers, uh, Twitter, all that stuff. And then at the very core, were just my customers, right? Those are my agency clients. And I was wasting a lot of time and resources creating all this stuff for people who are not paying me. So I made a lot of changes. Um, again, when I looked at my data, and I haven't, I just got here an hour ago, so I don't know what people talked about before, but I know mobile is very hot right now, but again, you have to consult your data. When I looked at the data from my website that does half million visits a year, it was 90% desktop traffic, right? Uh, so understanding that, understanding who my users were, who the people that were coming to my website consuming my content were, uh, they were almost all marketing professionals. They were not looking for agency services. So what I did uh, was we redesigned our website completely. We did two things. Number one, it seems kind of stupid, but we moved the, na the navigation to the left-hand side. We had a traditional top, top level navigation that had like services, case studies, testimonials on top and no one gave a shit because the people that were coming to our website were not interested in agency services, so we speak, did I just hear speak up? Okay. Um, so um, we shifted and we clearly broke out on the left-hand sidebar navigation agency. If you want agency, click here, tools and trainings. Uh, and again, it seems kind of stupid, right? But um, oh, I can't get the screenshot. What's going on with this clicker, man? Um, so basically the screenshot underneath this is kind of a shame because I have a bunch of these too. The screenshot underneath this, our bounce, our bounce rate instantly went from 78% down to 50%. Uh, and the reason why that's important, again, I don't know what people have spoken about before, but when we're talking about algorithms, not even just on Google now, but even on Facebook, they're looking heavily at how that traffic performs once it leaves their platform, specifically Google. So for example, if you're ranking for the keyword, Miami SEO in position five, somebody comes, they click your website and they leave right away, they don't engage, you're gonna end up getting demoted to the rank because if that continues to happen because you're not serving the right experience. So bounce rate, time on site, these things are incredibly important. We wanna make sure that people are coming to our websites and engaging and a large part of that is understanding who our audience is and making sure that we're serving the right experience. Um, you can also just see the spike in traffic over the last couple of months since we've made these changes. Um, our keyword rankings have shot up and it has nothing to do with links. We're just better focused on, a, we're focused on better content. We're focused on serving the right content. Google now understands what our website is about and it's realized that relevancy and it's rewarding us with much better ranks and a lot more traffic. So now it's a lot easier to convert people. Um, so again, this is what our concentric circles look like now. I'm still going out, I'm doing speaking engagements, doing YouTube videos, still trying to grow awareness, but pushing them into fans becomes a lot easier with better content and pushing them into paying customers becomes a lot easier because the content now helps to convert those people. Uh, and like I said, these small changes have a drastic impact on our income. So uh, 
I'm also going to throw in a lot of case studies from clients. It's one of the benefits of having a 100 client agency. Um, this is a consulting client of mine. They're Fetch My Vet. They are a South Florida startup. They basically have a network of amazing vets and they'll send them to your home. Um, this is a perfect example of people thinking, I don't want to say people because it's not just them, it's a lot of people. When we start a business, we have a, something in our mind of who we want our customers to be, right? Whether that's like premium or whether that's uh, just who we think that they should be based on our own personal biases. This is a perfect example of that. They thought their customer was one thing and they built their entire brand, their entire marketing around that and it wasn't performing well. So what we did is we, oh, damn it, we really dug into the data to get insights. So to understand the concentric circles for them, we looked at things like who was like, just basic stuff, like who was liking their Facebook page, right? That's an awareness channel. Who uh, was their Twitter followers? Um, who was engaging with their Facebook ads? Again, these are awareness style, these are awareness intent things that we use to understand the, the beginning tips of their audiences. Then we started getting into the fans part, we looked at um, their AdWords data, we looked at their live chat data, we looked at who was submitting contact forms on their website, right? Because these are people that are now within the inner circle. And then on the inner, innermost circle, we looked at who their customers are. Customers are. Uh, and what we found was that the audience was completely different. It was all women between the ages of 35 uh, and 50. They were suburban. Uh, and now they are going through a complete rebrand to focus their website, to focus their brand, to focus their marketing on that customer and blowing it out. Um, it's not done yet, but it's in the process. So for, man, this is really annoying. I'm sorry, guys. We had all these screenshots here. Can we get this fixed? Does anybody know why this is happening? No, because I have these things like set up to trigger. Um, okay, so I have a website. It's called Laces Out. It's an e-commerce website. I've actually talked about this before publicly in the past, but going through this process of understanding who our audience was, was um, in really understanding who our customers were, was understanding that number one, they were young, they were between like 14 and 19, really, really, really young. Uh, and anyone who's, who is familiar with people of that age know that they're impatient. Uh, they need a fast website. They're gonna be heavily mobile. This website is actually 95% mobile traffic. Um, they are comfortable with digital forms of payment and they prefer it, like they don't wanna pull out a credit card. Most of them don't even have one because they're so young. Um, so what we did is we, everywhere across the website, and this is lacesout.net, by the way, you can feel free to check it out on your own time. Everywhere across the website is check out with PayPal. We're trying to push people through that. We're trying to grease the wheels. We're trying to make it uh, as seamless and as frictionless as possible uh, to push conversions. And again, uh, what we did also is we made a one-page checkout, right? Like if you go to the, if you actually do make it to the cart page, you don't have to load a second page. It's all on that same page. Um, and uh, you can check out with PayPal there as well. We drastically saw our conversions increase overnight when we implemented this, especially the PayPal stuff. Um, the website converts at 12%, which is kind of unprecedented for an e-commerce website. Um, and this applies to all website, all verticals too. So this is, uh, I recently rebuilt my consulting website and I was originally using this website as kind of like an online resume. It had stuff about like my businesses, it had stuff about consulting, my agency, uh, like what I've done in the past. And because it picked up good links from sites like Moz, because I, I used to guest post a lot, it had pretty good rankings. It was on like page two for terms like digital marketing consultant. Um, but what I did was I went back, I looked at that data and I refocused it. And now if you go to that website, it's ryanwashere.com. The entire homepage is now dedicated to consulting. We threw in a bunch of semantic keywords like SEO consulting, Facebook consulting, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the results speak for themselves. I mean, it ranks on the first page now. It's top three for digital marketing consulting. And it drives a lot of additional leads for me as well. Um, now, so that was actually kind of all set up to talk about the user experience. Um, UX to me is something that, again, it's really not talked about a lot. Um, it's talked about through the scope of like on-page SEO, which I know Derek just spoke about too. Um, but honestly, if you guys have agencies out here, do how many people have agencies or in like marketing or something? Sell UX, it's, it's a huge money maker. If you wanna get 150K to 300K clients, sell UX um, through the scope of marketing, which I'm gonna talk about right now. So first of all, what is UX? Uh, UX stands for user experience. Um, it's often seen with a slash for UI, which stands for user interface. So real quickly, the difference between the two is user experience is the layout, right? It's what's on the page, uh, the imagery, the text, the content, um, the journey, the flow, all that stuff. And UI is just the design on top of it, right? The typography, the colors, the logos, that stuff. 
UX is more of a function of marketing, UI is more of a form of design. UX is often seen through the scope of design, but we, we approach it now as a marketing function because what we do is we're folding in on page, we're folding in keyword research, we're folding in audience, and we're building pages that people want to see for our audience, right? So uh, it focuses on making things easier for your customers, just like I said with the one page checkout on Laces Out, the PayPal, all that's a function of UX. Um, and again, it's laying out journeys, it's laying out flows, um, it's not really even getting into the design, which a lot of people think it is. So uh, again, what it does, it reduces friction, and increases conversions. This is a, again, this is a conversion-based practice. Um, websites are meant to make money, and uh, UX is a huge driver for that. It increases stickiness. So I just mentioned this briefly um, before, but a lot of where the algorithm is going now is towards engagement, right? So getting to the first page, is one thing, but getting to that first ranking is a whole nother beast, right? You can build all the links that you want, you can have all the keywords on the page, but if you don't have a sticky page, if you're not serving the right experience for that keyword, for that audience, you don't stand a chance. Um, and we're seeing a lot of pages now rank with no links because a lot of pages don't deserve links. And I know I might be speaking too technical SEO for some of the people out there, but basically what that means is if you just focus on building the right experience for your customers, you don't really have to worry about too much for SEO, especially in the e-commerce space. So <clears throat> it also increases user sentiment. So um, this shit annoys the hell out of me, pop-ups. Um, uh, I just don't know why people use them. Like, if you like pissing people off, um, that's fine. But what I hear all the time, why do people use them, right? Because they work, right? That's what they say all the time. But what happens is, is there's things that you're not measuring, like just measuring the conversion rate off of a form is one thing, but it's basic. Right, just looking at the conversion rate is not enough. What you're not looking at is how, how like people won't come back to your website. If I get a pop-up on a marketing website, I'm not coming back. I don't give a shit what you have to say because there's a hundred other people that are saying the same thing, right? Uh, it's really, really important that we're building and increasing user sentiment. Like people do not purchase on the first time they come to your website. They purchase on the comeback, right? Same thing with, same thing as if, you, if you're selling marketing services, you think people just come to your website and want to pay you $5,000 a month. It's not the way it works. You have to get user sentiment. You have to make them happy. Um, and there's ways around it, right? So one of the things that we did is we just built a custom plugin. Um, it just sits on the corner, right? It just sits. It doesn't pop up. If you want to get rid of it, there's a little X right there. Um, and it works. This converts at 7% on this page, which is as good or better as any pop-up that I've seen. But it also doesn't annoy people, right? Like people can still read the article without being annoyed. They can still consume it, um, and again, it increases that user sentiment. We're not annoying our, oh, this is so annoying, damn it. Man, okay, I'm just gonna have to walk you through this. So this is the, the marriage of, of UX and SEO. So, damn it, okay. So, so basically what these screenshots are is the one on the bottom, um, and this is really how we do keyword research a lot of the times. We'll marry the, the volume data with it later, but all we're really doing is we're starting with the main keyword of the business, and we're just using suggested search to dig down and to understand what else people are searching for when they're searching for that keyword, right? So for example, uh, the bottom screenshot there, it says shoelaces, and then if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of Google, it says um, searches related to shoelaces. And you can start to get a feel for when people are searching for shoelaces, what else they're searching for. So the one that I have highlighted there says round shoelaces. You click on round shoelaces, uh, and you can see the next screenshot there. Uh, you can see thick round shoelaces, thin round shoelaces, um, and then the one that I highlighted there says round athletic shoelaces, right? So again, we're starting to understand that people are starting to refine their searches a little bit more to understand what they're looking for. Uh, and then when you click on round athletic shoelaces and scroll all the way down to the bottom, you see that people are starting to search for branded, orthostep, that's a brand name, right? So people are throwing in brand, they're looking for a specific type of shoelace. Um, flat, they're also throwing in 54 inches, right? So we know they're also searching for sizing. So how can we apply that to a product page? Well, it's what we did. Um, so when we built our product pages, this is on lacesout.net, again, I strongly suggest that you just go to the website to check it out for yourself. Um, but we built these product pages around these keywords from a user point of view, right? We really wanted to make sure that we were capturing everything that people were searching for. So if you can see on here, um, you're going to see the semantic keywords in there, the suggested keywords in there, things like uh, replacement laces for Nike, right? That was things that people are searching for. That's throwing the brands in there. Um, the sizing, 72 inches, you can see flat, flat shoelaces, right? So really describing the type of shoelace that it is. Not only does it help people who are shopping for it, because they can read visually what they're looking at, uh, but it's amazing for search engines, right? I mean, all those keywords that we just saw, we're building a really good resource about shoelaces. 
Um, and underneath that, we put in a detailed description with sizing info. Again, I showed you that people are searching for sizing info. They want to see that. So we put it on the page. We hard code it in HTML. We get those keywords on the page. Again, it's also really good for users to see that. Um, and then we also, you can see the little blue highlights there. We internally linked the pages across on those um, sizing keywords, right, to drive more relevancy for that. And then what we did is we custom designed um, some boxes at the bottom. We were putting images of the sneakers that people were searching for, right? So I showed you that people searching for branded. We wanted to put that on the page, right? Especially as a user, SEO aside, if you want to understand if a shoelace is compatible with a shoe, that's kind of important, right? You don't want to buy shoelaces and get them home and be like, oh shit, this doesn't fit. Um, so we put the compatibility guide in the bottom. And again, not only does that help with the user experience on the page, but it adds these really valuable keywords to the page that people were clearly searching with before. So uh, the result of this is, is it's pretty astounding. I have literally have not, I talked, I spoke about this website as a case study at Cotton's last conference in October of uh, like a year and a half ago. I have literally not touched the web, not touched the website since then and it continues to go up. I have not built a single link to it. I have not had a single page of content to it. I have done absolutely nothing. All it does is generate passive income uh, and it continues to go up and I wish you could see that screenshot underneath to it. Like if you Google any sort of shoelace term, we have like five rings on the first page. Just, the website just crushes it and it's, in my opinion, 100% because of the user experience that we built. So, <sighs> number three. Does anybody have any questions on that, by the way? I know I talk fast. No? All right, I'm gonna keep talking fast. Okay, so it's not all about your website. This is something that we're doing a lot of with clients. Um, a lot of the times, especially with smaller, newer websites that don't have a lot of authority, they don't have a lot of brand pull, um, it's really tough to get movement on it. Again, especially if you're just starting a website from scratch, e-commerce, whatever it may be, you should really be looking at other opportunities to get exposure. Like, like I said, a lot of times we focus way too much on just our website and we lose tr track of the fact that people are not just going to websites and buying, they're all over the internet, they're looking around. Um, we've gotta hit multiple touch points and this is an awesome way to do it. Um, so like I said, sometimes algorithmically, it's not even just on Google now, it's social media too. Social media does not want to give a lot of exposure to people, um, so we've got to look for other ways. Sometimes algorithmically, it's just not possible to get exposure with your website and just trying to jam it uh, with like old school marketing tactics, it's not going to help you out. It's not only going to hurt your website, but it's just going to be a complete waste of time and resources. So we can use this to our advantage, um, but more importantly too, this is about leveraging the authority of other properties, right? This is a Nielsen case study that shows that, um, says that people are four times more likely to buy when referred to a friend. It's why, you know, getting out and meeting people is never going out of style, especially if you're an agency. Um, but we can leverage that in the internet too. So here's an example. One of our clients are called Teamy. They sell tea. Um, and I don't know if you guys know this, but Starbucks owned a brand called Tivana that recently went out of business. And we decided, we found that a lot of people were searching for like Tivana replacements, right? Um, because they were looking to buy the same tea. Maybe not the same tea, but tea that's similar. Um, if we were to just publish on Timmy's website, like, hey, we're a Tivana replacement, we might be able to get it to rank, we might be able to get some traffic off social to it, but no one's gonna take it seriously because they're gonna be like, oh, you sell tea, awesome, like, congrats, you know? Um, it's, not a, it's not a very genuine referral, but, if we could get them listed in an article on another website, on an authority website, that's a huge referral, right? So uh, these roundup, I call them roundup styles or like listicle style articles. They rank really, really well for branded terms. Um, you see them on like HuffPost all the time, Forbes, and they're shit articles too, um, but they just rank really well because Google knows that when somebody's searching for something like this, they don't want to see a brand's website, they want to see more of a listicle. It's like the same thing with Yelp when you're searching for like an attorney or something, or like Avvo, why all those roundup sites work really well because they're third-party referrals that add a sense of unbiased, even though you pay for them, but um, that add a sense of unbiased to it. So um, all we did, uh, it's really easy, you just gotta find someone who's writing about these topics and then just send them an email with a pitch. Um, and we just pay them. We paid this girl 100 bucks to add, to write this article. She put our client as number two in here, um, and that's that, it now ranks, and it drives referral traffic, and the client is beyond happy, and we got an amazing link from an SEO point of view, but it also drives a ton of awareness and a ton of, a ton of traffic and sales for the website as well. So uh, another example here, this is for a client, they're called Predator Nutrition. They are a UK-based supplement brand. They sell like protein and 
uh, like bodybuilding supplements and stuff like that. So what we found when we were going through the keyword research process, again, I don't touch any of these tools. I just use Google search. It tells us everything we need to know. You can see that, uh, so this is a product, by the way, uh, Blackstone Labs Dust V2. It's a, I don't know what it does. It's a product. Um, but the number two, pretty much across the board for all their products, like whenever somebody's looking for a product, they're always looking for reviews. Um, again, it's really difficult to get your website to rank for a product that you're selling plus reviews. Um, so what we found was that it's either getting on a site like, uh, like Top 10 Supplements, again, a Roundup style website, um, who just wanted, they were basically charging like a thousand a month for, for review on there, we weren't gonna pay that. Um, but YouTube videos also rank really, really well for review-based keywords. So uh, what we did is we just had the client go through and had one of their staff members create a review video of every single product on their website. Uh, we embed those products on the product pages and then just did like some very basic promotion like on Reddit, uh, like on forum threads, whatever, just dropping links. Um, and you can see their video down there at the bottom. It ranks for all these keywords now, and it's just collecting passive views, driving awareness, and uh, it's free exposure, you know what I mean? Uh, especially for review keywords, which are very high intent. Like if somebody's looking for reviews, they're ready to buy, right? They're just looking for the right vendor to do that from. So um, that's another way to steal some, some exposure. Um, so how many people here do e-com or want to do e-commerce? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a tough sled in getting started. Um, and uh, a lot of the times, either a brand is gonna dominate or Amazon, Etsy, you know, these authority platforms just dominate as well. So uh, instead of fighting that, I suggest you embrace it, um, especially if you're just getting started. This is an example from a client, uh, Rada Beauty, they sell like lavender oil, yeah, like lavender oil, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but like natural, natural products. Um, and what we found was that Amazon just dominated. But what we also found was that a lot of brands weren't selling on Amazon because of, you know, it's a pain in the ass selling Amazon. The, 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 they take a big cut. Um, there's regulations, they're always changing their terms of service. And a lot of brands just don't really want to deal with it. So a lot of the times they just don't. I'll say this, they're migrating more now, but there's definitely opportunity for exposure on Amazon, but then also to rank organically through Amazon. So for example, uh, what we did was we did a uh, manual keyword research where we took all their keywords that we were targeting for their website for SEO, right? We then had one of our VAs overseas go through and build a list of every time that keyword was triggering Amazon results, right? So if lavender oil was triggering Amazon search listings, we knew that number one, Google wanted to show Amazon, but number two, that we could jam up their Amazon store in the rankings. So Amazon SEO is not too different than normal e-commerce SEO. It's about optimizing the on-page, uh, hitting it with some links. Um, and you can see here, so this is one of the products that sells rose hip oil, it's 100,000 searches a month, and their Amazon store is ranking first for that search, right? So Amazon in itself, you can rank internally in Amazon but you can also use the authority of Amazon to rank in Google search, and it's pretty easy to do too, um, because Amazon is such an authority website, and like I said, Google's gonna tell you what it wants to rank. If it is already ranking Amazon sites, don't even bother trying to jam your website up there. You can, but just do it on Amazon. It'll be much easier, faster, and cheaper as well. Um, so this is uh, an example from our brand, from Weber. So uh, I used to guest post a lot. Um, and I used to write for Moz, and one of the things that I did was I wrote this article, uh, this is years ago, this is from 2015, so this is what, what are we in, 2019, 2018? It's like three years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, and it was about SEO services. Moz is, a br is just an, an incredibly powerful website in the SEO space, as some of you probably know, uh, and the keyword SEO services is just brutally competitive. It's a national keyword. It's my website would never rank for it um, without doing some pretty shady stuff. So, um, oh, this worked. So you can see here, if you Google SEO services, this article ranks nationally, which is huge. <laughs> it's huge, I mean, it's awesome for Moz, but it's also good for me because it drives a lot of referral traffic. I mean, you, I wish you could see the screenshot underneath it, but it ranks for a lot of valuable keywords. Um, and you can see over just the last couple of months, it's driven about 1,200 visits to our website. But more importantly, it's driven 127, those are, those are contact form submissions. 
right? So those are people coming to our website that want to work with us as an agency. That's pretty incredible if you think about it. Um, and we, it's a high intent keyword. And again, it's leveraging the authority and the referral of Moz. Like if you're on Moz, that's one thing. If you're on Moz ranking for SEO services when someone's looking for it, they found out that you wrote the article, it's, it's a done deal. Um, so not only is the conversion rate high at 10%, which is amazing, but the conversion rate from lead to client is very high as well. Um, so this is another example. This is something that we do, some bug up here, um, something that we do for uh, a lot of local clients. I actually just wrote a blog post about this. Um, so what we did for this client, they're called Dr. Smooth. They have like 10 locations down in South Florida, up in New York now too. Um, but we segmented between their website, their Yelp pages, and then using like PR to steal all of the SERPs. So we used their website to rank for like Miami Cafe. Uh, and then the secondary keyword was Miami Coffee Shops. We used their Yelp page to rank for that. Uh, and then the third keyword, which is really valuable, is these best keywords, right? So like best coffee shops in Miami, um, best cafes in Miami. It's really hard to get your website to rank for that because again, people don't wanna see your website if they're looking for the best because they know that you think you're the best. Um, but if you get on um, like Miami New Times as best of, then you can rank very easily. And again, just the authority of that being listed locally as the best is very powerful. And it's the same process that I've re re referred to before. I mean, PR is actually pretty easy. It's just a matter of going out and finding the people that are already writing about this stuff, sending them an email, um, you know, with a pitch, and then usually they just want money. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you take away anything, the stuff before marketing tactics, this is a business tactic. Um, processizing everything to the point of exhaustion is Again, it's the re like my agency sold not because of our book of business, which was great. It was over 100K a month in retainers, but we were acquired mainly because of our processes. So what that means is that everything within our business had a standard set process. Um, my people were highly trained. We had offshore teams that were highly trained and we had software that we built to automate these processes as well, which makes you highly profitable. And what you're gonna find out building an agency is that it's one thing to have one or two clients by yourself, making 10 grand a month at 80% revenue, but when you have 50 clients, it's not like that. Um, it gets expensive, you gotta hire people, you got software, you got overhead. Um, agencies are not nearly as profitable as a lot of people wanna let you out to be. So, if you have processes in place, it allows you to reduce your labor costs drastically by hiring lower cost labor because realistically anybody can follow a process, right? Which I'm gonna talk about right now. So. Um, pro processes are really what make any business scale, especially service-based businesses, e-commerce too, which I'll show you. Um, but a lot of people are hesitant to adopt processes, um, but really a process is a roadmap. Um, there's just a million things to do when you're building a business, and a process not only gives you a framework and it gives you a roadmap, uh, but it helps you stay organized. It helps you stay on top of everything. Like it's a lot easier to manage processes as opposed to managing tasks and deliverables, right? If you're managing processes, you can scale up a lot faster and a lot easier. Um, processes are not set in stone. This is another common misconception. People think that specifically when we're talking about like marketing services and SEO that like it needs to be custom. It's so hard to do, blah, 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 blah. It's technical. Um, it's not, we're not doing brain surgery here, right? I say this all the time, we're selling people shit that they don't need, it's not rocket science. Um, it can be boiled down to a process and once you have that process, that's the beauty of it, is that once the process is done, you're easily able to, to change it. You're able to see gaps. Um, you're able to be a lot more agile. It's a lot easier to move things around when you have a set process to identify where the errors are, the gaps, the inefficiencies, uh, it's a lot easier to fix than to build something from scratch, trust me. Um, again, process lets you see gaps. It lets you be a manager and not a doer. Again, uh, all of my local people are trained to be managers and not doers. Um, I prefer that if I'm paying you 80 grand a year, 60 grand a year, whatever it is, that you're not doing data entry and spreadsheets, which pretty much a lot of marketing is, let's be serious. Um, but I want you to be able to manage people who are doing that at scale so we can, again, grow and scale profitably um, 
Again, it's a lot easier to hire someone to just do keyword research than it is to hire someone to do SEO. And that's a mistake that a lot of agencies make is if you're starting to bring people in house, which I'll talk about, you hire somebody locally, you're like, I need you to be an SEO expert. Um, that's a lot, you know what I'm saying? Like there's a lot that goes into doing SEO. So what we did is we built a system to train people to do micro tasks within that, which I'm gonna show you. Um, so a process just saves you money. Um, this is what I live by, a huge key to SEO and really into life is getting other people to do, work, to do your work for you. Um, you, it's really, unless you're charging a hell of a lot of time for a lot of money, a lot of money for your time, it's really difficult to, and again, I'm not saying that your goal is to make a lot of money, but if you wanna make a lot of money, like you gotta be able to scale your time. Um, you've gotta be, have people doing the work for you and having a process allows you to do that a lot easier and a lot faster as well. Um, so this is just a quote from Abraham Lincoln. It's just about basically doing all the work up front, like Pareto's principle, 80-20. It's really processes for me, it's like 95-5. You do 95% of the work in setting it up, uh, and then 5% in just managing that process uh, and focusing your time and attention on other things. So yeah, a large majority of everything that we do can be boiled down to a step-by-step -step process. Again, I actually had this conversation my business partners were in town this week and we brought a videographer, a contractor in town and he was like, yeah, you know, like video editing is just a creative process. I was like, yeah, but it's a process nonetheless. Like your brain follows a specific thing. Like when you're building a video, when you're editing a video, like everything can be boiled down into a standard operating procedure. Um, and it sucks doing it, but it's really important. And the important thing is, is that anybody uh, can follow a well-written process, right? Like it's really not rocket, like doing keyword research is not hard to do at all. It's data entry, really. Um, especially when you build out a process tree for them to follow, anybody can do it. Um, so importantly though, a framework is not a process. So a framework is a high level template. Like um, if you're outsourcing SEO, so just as an example, like let's look at SEO, like a framework to do SEO would be like a technical audit and keyword research and on-page optimization and content and link building, right? That's a framework, it's not a process. And a lot of people, again, don't get down enough into the weeds and wanna try and outsource SEO or outsource link building. And again, it's still not, it's still not good enough. Um, wow. Um, so the difference is, is just, it, it's, it's down in the details, right? So let's break down a technical audit a little bit more. So within a technical audit, I mean, all the way down into the weeds, right? You need access to Search Console, Analytics, Tag Manager, whatever it is that you're using. Uh, you gotta do a website crawl. You gotta review the robots.txt file. You gotta uh, review status codes, 301s, 404s, et cetera. Uh, review 301 redirects, and then et cetera, et cetera, send it to the client, right? Even more so than that, like, we still don't wanna give this to somebody, cause like, I, how many people here know what a robots.txt file is, right? Um, well, great. Um, but even so, most of the people don't, right? So we can't just be like, hey, go review this robots.txt file as part of the technical SEO, and it's still not enough. What we really wanna do uh, is we wanna turn processes into checklists. Um, so what that means, if we just blow out reviewing 301 redirects even more, which is a sub-process of the process, um, it starts by opening up the CSV version of the screaming frog crawl, right? Uh, we're literally gonna filter, call, and these are like literally taken directly from our technical SEO audit process. Um, filter column L to review status codes, uh, cross check 301 redirect. So does everyone know what a 301 redirect is? It's basically when you tell your server and, and browsers to push one page into another. So what we wanna do is review, make sure that we review to make sure that that's the right page, that it's redirecting to the right page. Uh, we wanna check for redirect hops to make sure that the page isn't redirected twice, et cetera, et cetera. So you can start to see now that we can break down something that's pretty technical and pretty confusing um, if you just give someone the guidance to do so. Uh, and what this has allowed us to do is we run very te advanced technical SEO audits that we charge, I don't even know, like. $25,000 for, and we have somebody offshore do it for like $42. It's pretty profitable for us. I'm dead ass serious, like it's amazing. Um, and we're able to scale that um, because their time to do it isn't as expensive, and then we have our SEO manager who we're paying a lot of money, he just reviews them, right? So we're able to scale his time, we're able to do a lot more of these audits, and we're able to crank a lot more work out and just be a lot more profitable and the quality's improved too because our SEO manager isn't burnt out 
from having to do four technical SEO audits a week. He's just reviewing four technical SEO audits, which takes a fraction of his time, which makes him happier, which makes his job easier, which makes culture at the agency better, right? It feeds the whole business and it just makes things better. Like if you can make your employees' lives easier, it's a good thing. So uh, this is pushing a little bit more into our e-commerce just to review like a, 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 another sample process for something a little bit even more basic. So uh, we automated content creation on that site for a while. Um, and basically what I did was just built a step-by-step -step process to do so. So uh, we would create blog posts about like sneaker releases, right? Because we we're selling shoelaces for like Nikes, for Adidas, things along that nature. Um, and there's a lot of search volume around people searching for like, I don't know if you guys like sneakers or not, but like there's a lot of search volume for it. Um, so what we did uh, is we built a process for a, a, one of our offshore VAs to subscribe to like these public release calendars for like Nike, Adidas, they have like a calendar that will tell you uh, when these sneakers are releasing. So what we do is we subscribe to those and we basically, we just kind of automated a system where we're getting a feed of all these things, kind of like an RSS feed for your blog content, but for sneaker releases, right? So we'd subscribe to those, and what we would do is we would then take those and turn them into blog, we'd turn them into social content and blog content. So when a new sneaker release was announced, what we'd do is we'd save those images to the desktop, we'd upload them to Facebook, create a short video, uh, schedule those posts to go live, and basically automated social content on both Instagram and Facebook, which were big channels for our audience. We would then, he, would, he was then trained to then take that content and just upload it to WordPress, create a short blog post, exactly how to write the title. We literally told him how to write, write the title every time, embed the Facebook video, uh, insert the link of where you found it, um, even using Photoshop. I'm not gonna bore you to death here. Um, and this is not the right version, that's okay. Um, but the point is, is that after that, so that being aside, I'm just gonna skip this slide real quick. This one too, because um, what I wanna talk about. So once your processes are built, you basically got three options. You can hire somebody locally to do it, which is expensive, um, but it's fine. We have plenty of local people, they're awesome. You can offshore it, which uh, we are big proponents of. Again, we're very profitable using offshore, combination of offshore and, and local labor. Um, but you can also automate it. And that's kind of where we're at now is, again, like once the, with the agency offloaded, we're just building a lot of software that alleviates a lot of these processes, a lot of these pain points for agencies and for marketers. Um, and honestly, where things are going, um, it's all about automation, right? I mean, in 10 years, this room is gonna look very different. Um, and what we're talking about is gonna look very different. So I'm hedging on that and just building a lot of it based on that. Um, and that's pretty much all I got. Do you guys have any questions?